All right, welcome to our 10 minute lecture on the brief history of the Industrial Revolution and its outcomes. Brought to you by your fellow humanities students, Julia, Mackenzie, and Jacob. We want to give you, the consumer, insight to factory owners, the rapid expansion of technological advancements, the cost for workers, and how it paved the future. Things that we often take for granted, like unions, equal worker opportunities, and a minimum standard for employees were all created through very unforgiving conditions. Specifically, our presentation will cover the rise of the Industrial Revolution, its competing forces, its drive into America, and the Tolman strike for a point of reference. Now let's consider for a moment why the Industrial Revolution was needed. Most people resided in small communities where life revolved around farming. The average living condition was pretty awful, it was hard to earn money, malnourishment and disease were rampant, and people actually produced the bulk of their, all of their own supplies. Industrialization was a turning point that changed the standard for working class. Special purpose machinery and invented factories alongside the mass production of goods. Seems pretty awesome on paper. Although the exact start of the Industrial Revolution is still for debate, many seem to agree that this guy holds most of the responsibility. A wig maker at the beginning of his career, Richard Arkwright was one of seven children. His most notable, notable contribution, however, is that of the modern factory system in a little area called Cromford in Derbyshire. It consisted of creating the first organized environment that contained power, machinery, semi-skilled labor force, and the raw material like cotton that he could turn into yarn for clothing. This factory environment, combined with inventions like the spinning jenny, spinning frame, water frame, and the power loom, really set the tone for a big increase for the textile industry all of which took a really big stand in Britain, and rightfully so. They had a large portion of resources, like coal and iron, as well as a structured colonial system for external resources. Gaining such an edge on the free market, however, would soon mess things up for the majority of Europe. Now, during the vast majority of the remaining 19th century, Britain did a pretty solid job of maintaining status as the powerhouse of the world. Factories were impressively exporting textiles, machinery, and several types of goods to the rest of the world, London was the financial capital of the world, and by 1850, a majority of their population was in urbanized cities. Needless to say, their jump on the whole industrialization thing really gave them an advantageous position during this time frame. So naturally, related countries started competing. In fact, Britain was doing so well that many countries started implementing tariffs on the goods that they were producing for their own industrial rises. Belgium being the first to industrialize, but Germany being the most successful. France was somewhere in the process, but not really doing anything too noteworthy. Germany's success was in large part to the progressive railway system and takeover of the steel industry. The ability to transport goods within railways became a very important factor to the race to industrialize. And although Russia had so much space to try doing so, internal conflicts between progressives and Luddites, or those in opposition to industrialize, continued to fight over this age-old question. Needless to say, it is also at this point that the United States becomes an equally impressive competitor to Britain in terms of industrialization and economic opportunity. America's prosperity in becoming an equal powerhouse is no surprise really. They had ample amounts of land to build on, resources to extract, rivers and canals to transport, and within a hundred years they gained a labor force of nearly 25 million immigrants. Once electrification and the Bessemer process were introduced to America, Factories and monopolies were a common trend for the working class, which is where we get to the good stuff. I mean, conditions within factories were so dangerous, unsanitary, and soul-depleting that people actually needed to create a national child labor committee in order to set some ground rules. This is the time period where ground rules were established because some industry owners didn't feel a need to take any worker's life into consideration. The company owners like Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Pullman, who we'll get to in a second, pay little consideration for workers because they believe that workers should be grateful for having a job in the first place. And it kind of makes sense. There was a luring quality to cities as being more prosperous than a farm. Granted, there wasn't much local news back then, so people moved in droves for work, making any job valuable to the people. This meant that factory owners could pay little regard for the semi-skilled labor force since there was such a long line out the door. Factory inspectors were often bribed to look the other way because they were so poor, and the people at the top reaped nearly all of the benefits. George Pullman was somewhat of an unusual case considering the standard for industrialization. His monetary success came after engineering and designing the Pullman sleeping car, which at the time was essentially the Rolls Royce of long-term transportation. Considering it could take anywhere between 6 to 14 days to travel across the states in a train, 
Pullman sort of hit a gold mine with his idea. Introduced just after the Civil War in 1865, he continued to develop his sleeper cars into hotel rooms on wheels. But as you can imagine, who was going to design and mass produce these luxury cars? The poor working class, of course. Pullman then got the brilliant idea of opening up his own town so that he could house all of his workers and force them to work full time, pay him rent, and shop at all the stores that he owned. In addition, he made it so that alcohol was forbidden, as if they'd need to drink their pain away anyway. Church was highly encouraged, and essentially, Pullman's workforce was lured in with seemingly solid conditions, decent pay, affordable housing, and a town named after him. And a jib! This particular workforce had yet to unionize, however, and during an economic downturn of the late 1800s, Georgie, whose net worth at the time of his death exceeded $17 million, had the rails to lower wages for all employees in addition to laying people off. All the while by keeping rent and utilities the same. As you can imagine, workers had difficulty paying bills and rent in his town and weren't really able to say or do anything about it. This led to what's known as a wildcat strike, something that was later defined as illegal in 1935. This violent strike, led by the workers of Pullman, Chicago, was backed by Eugene Debs of the American Railroad Union and then gained nationwide attention. Debs and the ARU were able to boycott Pullman cars on railways because of his greedy and unreasonable behavior, but the strike left a substantial mark on the industry. During this time of boycott across the nation, 30 people were killed in riots and there was an estimated $80 million in damages. This strike got so bad that President Grover Cleveland had to send the army in to stop the strikers from interfering with trains. Against an order by the Supreme Court to stop the strike, Debs continued to fight for his workers. Inevitably, the ARU was dissolved for all actions, Debs was sentenced to six months in prison for violating the court's order, and Pullman eventually was forced to sell off his residential town in 1897. Immediately following the Pullman strike, some pretty big things gained recognition. This example of mistreating workers made a big impression to other industry leaders and arguably set the tone for innovators like Henry Ford to encourage a labor force that wanted to work for him, helping his industry boom during the mid-1900s. Labor Day, in fact, was established as a national holiday in large part of the failed attempts to end the strike by Groover Cleveland. National recognition of this event brought a big change to the endowments of the working class and overall brought back something of mutual respect for one another. Although the events were undoubtedly horrific to those involved, it was an important step to the modernized world we take advantage of today, and for better or for worse, established the foundation of the modern economy. Since the Pullman strike, there have been notable advancements in the treatment of workers and civilians alike. From civil rights movements to political narratives and remarkable advancements in literary and scholarly contributions. This was a dark period in our history, full of what seems like smog and loud machines, but without its heavy emphasis, there may not have been such a strong desire to look inward at what it meant to be a human living in this time period. Meaning that vast and important humanitarian efforts were produced almost because there was such a need for it at this time. Influence and ideas from Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, and Charles Dickens would not have been as important or indulged if it weren't for the exploitation of the majority population. Considering that, employee rewarding businesses would not stand so strong in today's society if it weren't for revolutionary thinking in the first place. To quote Charles Dickens, the whole difference between construction and creation is exactly this, that a thing constructed can only be loved after it is constructed, but a thing created is loved before it exists. America today certainly seems both politically and economically unpredictable, competitive, and supportive for those already at the top, but with immense power residing in the masses, it's hard to believe that change won't ensue if it's important enough to come together and fight for it, which in and it of itself is coming together for the purpose of creating something new.